According to the standard model, the nucleus of an atom consists of neutrons and protons. And the electrons are arranged around this nucleus. So, if we take all three of these standard particles we've just mentioned, among them the most stable, the most predictable, and let's say the most well understood subatomic particle is the proton. Moreover, the proton is also the most stable particle among the entire zoo of particles currently known to us. And until recently, scientists believed that this was indeed the case. But relatively recent research has shown that in fact the proton is not the particle we thought we knew so well. It is not the particle we have correctly imagined. And most importantly, it is very likely that the properties of the proton differ significantly from the properties we currently know. For a long time it was believed that there is a certain unchanging number of protons. If you remember Eddington, who spent a lot of time playing with the cosmological constant and trying to determine its value. Well, he also came up with a way to calculate the number of protons in the universe. And even if the method itself might be incorrect, even if it might seem strange, it highlights one characteristic detail. Physicists of that time believed that the proton is an unchanging particle, that the proton is a stable particle, and that protons are so predictable that they simply don't go anywhere. According to all prevailing ideas, protons really never decayed, and it was assumed that the proton is such an eternal thing, which in fact is comparable to the lifetime of the universe. Now, perspectives have changed a little. There have been, let's say, additions. For example, additions to the idea that the lifetime of a proton is actually not infinite, as was previously thought, but rather comparable to the age of the universe or the part of it that is known. You have to agree, these are, let's say, slightly different formulations when it comes to the balance of priority. And when we talk about a proton that never decays, that can live forever, by all definitions of what eternity is, whatever it may be, and a proton that can exist for no less than the entire known universe has existed, these are still somewhat different things. And essentially, scientists have thus stated that the lifetime of a proton may be limited. And why is that? These ideas largely formed because, for a long time, as you may recall, physicists described subatomic particles and atoms themselves as little balls. Yes just like ordinary mechanical objects that you can touch with your hands, roll around, interact with mechanically, and do whatever you want with them. In practice, it turned out that any particle that reaches a certain measured range enters a quantized range of measurements. And quantum physics itself is, let's say, quite unconventional. And so, the perspective that allowed physicists to describe the proton as a tiny mechanical sphere suddenly shifted to the view that the proton is a certain particle, which is also made up of something and possesses strange properties. And to begin with, the composition of the proton was described as a structure consisting of so-called quarks. Largely based on the fact that quarks form such particles as the proton, it was long believed that the proton is quite stable. Why? because scientists could not and still cannot find quarks in an isolated state. And from this it was assumed that if quarks interact so strongly with each other, forming such strong bonds, such strong pairs, and if there are no single quarks, then probably if quarks form a certain configuration, that configuration will be stable. But in reality it turned out that inside the proton there are not only quarks, not only the up and down quarks. Instead of just two up quarks and one down quark, scientists said that there are also various other particles inside the proton. And so, these two up quarks and one down quark are actually not the complete structure of the proton. If you look at the modern diagram of the proton, which has undergone a number of changes, you'll notice that along with the quarks that are there and are connected, there are also various other particles present, such as, for example, gluons. What are gluons? They are particles that transmit the strong interaction. These are particles that essentially act as atomic glue. And so essentially, most likely, quarks are connected to each other thanks to the existence of these particles. But in addition to these well-known or, let's say, well-mathematically described particles, there is a lot of other interesting stuff inside the proton. I can't tell you exactly what is in there right now, but you don't need to rush to criticize me, because no self-respecting scientist can tell you with any great certainty what is inside a proton right now. For a long time, the proton has not been considered a simple mechanical sphere, it has its own structure. And now, the proton has an even more complex structure. Therefore, all the ideas about the proton that existed before these studies were presented, this is not a one-time event, but rather a long and ongoing scientific endeavor. And all of this changes our understanding of what a proton is in terms of physics, even among standard particles. 
The next point that influenced our understanding of the proton is information about the proton's mass. After all, according to standard notions, if we have, say, three bricks and we put them on a scale, we get the mass of the three bricks that we weighed. But that's not how it works with the proton. When the well-known quarks were taken, there is a calculated mass for these quarks. They calculated the mass of the proton, measured it experimentally, and it turned out that the mass of the proton does not match the total mass of the quarks that make it up. How can that be? Well, at the very least, this confirms the ideas we outlined a bit earlier. And this means that inside the proton, there are not only quarks, but something else as well. Moreover, the mass of the quarks makes up only 1% of the total mass of the proton. And this points to only one thing, that we were not mistaken about the quantum soup. What else does this tell us? It also tells us that Einstein's idea about the conversion of mass into energy is correct as well. Each particle is characterized by its own spin. And so it turns out that, of course, the proton also has a spin. And now comes the most interesting part. When scientists began to study this question closely, it turned out that the proton exhibits what is known as the proton spin crisis. This proton spin crisis lies in the fact that if we mathematically calculate the values associated with quarks, their spins, and compare them to what we observe in the proton as a whole, it turns out that we only account for 30% of the motion that actually exists in reality. How is that possible? Well, actually, there isn't a clear answer to this question, and we assume that, in addition to the motion of quarks, something else also contributes to the motion and spin of the proton. At the moment, this issue has been explained by the existence of gluon spin, which is part of the proton structure. But, by and large, it turns out that even this might not be enough. The next widely known issue that calls into question our understanding of the proton's structure is called the proton radius crisis or the proton radius puzzle, or whatever you want to call it. There's this thing called monium. Under certain conditions, in a regular atom where electrons orbit the nucleus, you can replace the electrons with muons, which will then orbit the atom's nucleus instead. It would be logical to assume that, even though muons have characteristics different from electrons, the calculated values for their distance from the atomic nucleus should correlate with what we observe for electrons. In practice, however, we get a completely different story. It turns out that if you recalculate everything for muons orbiting the nucleus, the size of the proton in this case should be different. How is that possible? No one knows how that can be. Thank you all for your attention. Wishing you all the very best. See you next time.